Thanks for his love this morning. Sing it out.
Well, happy Father's Day. How's everybody doing? Man, it's good to see you guys. We are in week three of our marriage series. Today, we are going to cover this uh, topic called, What Would the Kids Say? If I were to interview your kids on your marriage, what would your kids have to say about what goes on in your home, about what's done in your home, about what's said in your home, right? There's a verse in the Bible, I, I want to get right to it and, it, and it comes out of the book of James, okay? And as you look at the book of James, you have to understand some things about what's going on inside of the book of James. James is written as a um, result of Ch Acts chapter uh, like 17, 16, 17, 18, something like that, where Stephen is stoned by Paul. Do you guys remember this, where Stephen is stoned by Paul? He stands up, he preaches, they, they all are standing there, and, and they stone him, and then they lay all their shirts at Paul's feet, right? As a way of saying, Paul, you're responsible for this. If you look, it says right after that that the apostles were scattered among the nations, right? James is written because at the moment in which they were scattered, we find the book of James, the very first thing it says, James, a servant of God, to the 12 tribes scattered among the nations, okay? The reason they're scattered is because they were scared, they were in disbelief, they'd lost their homes, their livelihood, everything that was regular was no longer regular, and James is writing to them because they're in incredible, under incredible pressure. What happens when we get under incredible pressure? We all of a sudden have what's called the toothpaste test, right? And we get squeezed, and whatever comes out of the toothpaste tube is probably toothpaste, right? Whatever comes out of us when we're squeezed is probably who we are. And what James is saying is don't allow yourself to be squeezed by Satan, all right? Now, James chapter 1, verse 19, here we go as we kind of talk about this subject of what would the kids say. Know this, my beloved brothers. Let every person be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. Therefore, put away all filthiness, rampant wickedness, and receive meekness, the implanted word, which is able to save you and your souls. Okay. I want you to kind of think about this as we kind of put in. Have you ever been in a situation where your kids humiliated you with something that they said? Anybody? Think about it for a moment. I don't want to hear it. You don't have to go, oh, yeah, there was this time. My, my brother's kids... <laughs> I won't tell you which brother because I don't want to embarrass him, but when he was younger, man, one of them would say anything to anyone at any time. He would repeat anything to anyone. And you never told this kid anything because you knew that it would come up at the most awkward, inopportune time. I remember being in, in uh, I remember stories of him being in elevators where he would look at someone and tell them what looked strange about them. Like he would walk up to a complete stranger and go, oh my, you have a mole. I mean, that was just kind of who he was, right? And, and he just, whatever came to his mind came straight out of his mouth, right? And, and he was a sponge of information. You had to watch what you said in front of this kid because he was going to repeat whatever was said. Maybe you have a kid like that in your home, right? And that's why I said, okay, what would the kids say about your marriage? James is talking to people under complete and utter emotional duress, they're upset, which is where we find ourselves a lot of times when we're going through hard marriage situations, okay? We are pressed on every side. We're stressed. We're emotional. And what is our first normal response when we do that, when we get that way? We just kind of just vomit on one another, don't we? We say things that we don't mean, okay? James is writing to a bunch of people who are under emotional distress, and here's what he says. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Let me ask you a question. When you're under emotional distress, do you go, oh, I really need to stop talking here? Does that come through your mind? That does not come through my mind a lot of times. It doesn't come natural, I think, to people. Tell me if this is you. Are you ever in a conversation where you're frustrated with somebody and they're giving you their side and they're going, well, la, 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 and you're over here, you're like, you've got it all planned out. The moment they shut up, I'm going to lay out the greatest plan of, of discovery for them that they've ever felt in their life. Bleh! You know what I mean? You're like, oh, come on, come on. And you ever meet them when they're like, they have those short pauses you're talking to people, and you think they're done, but they're not really done? You ever talk to those people? They're like, and so, you know, I felt like you did this, and you're just ready to talk, and they go, and, blah, 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 and you're like, oh, come on, just shut up so I can tell you what I think of you, right? You ever get in that situation? James is writing to them, and he's going, don't lead with that. Be quick to listen and slow to speak. Slow to become angry because he says this statement next. You ready? He uses the word produce. 
Let's see if we can pull it up. For anger of man does not produce. What is produce? Not produce. What is produce? Right? Think about it. It is the production, uh, the, the consequence of whatever we do. Right? In other words, what James is saying to these people is be quick to listen. Be very slow to speak. Because whatever your words are that come out of your mouth, they are going to produce something in your life, in your marriage, and among your kids. I want you to think back to the last time you got in a big fight with your spouse, okay? And you said something that you shouldn't have. What did it produce? Do you know? Sometimes we're not even aware. Sometimes we're very aware. What I want to do today is kind of help you understand what we got to do and what we got to be careful of so that we don't produce a marriage that is set for destruction, okay? So if you got your Bibles, do me a favor real quick, and I want you to go to the book of Song of Solomon. Not too many people go to this book because, to be honest with you, there's some awkward things in this book and people don't like to really read it in front of groups. I'm not, don't worry, I'm not going to read anything to you awkward today. That was last week, okay? This week we are not going to be awkward. But here's what I would say. If I've, if I've dealt with, with marriages enough, I, I came to this understanding. You ready? The understanding that this happens. There is a bank account in your marriage, okay? And I say this to everyone that I meet with. There is a bank account in your marriage with your spouse. And you may know what I'm talking about, but you may not know what I'm talking about. What is a bank account? Every single time you say something incredibly nice, right, or encouraging, or that makes them feel good about themselves, it's called a deposit, right? Every time that you say something that is not so nice, it is a withdrawal, okay? Now stop for a second. Think amongst yourself for just a moment. Do you make more withdrawals from your spouse? Or do you make more deposits? This is an interesting concept, this, this withdrawals and deposits thing. You want to know why? Because women hold on to things forever. Am I right, girls? I mean, you can think back to 1997 at 3 o'clock in the afternoon. It was a sunny day. It was blah, 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 when he said blah, right? And men, right? We can get mad, and we can blow up, and we can say the most horrible, hateful things, and 15 minutes later, we're like, hey, cool, want to watch some TV? I mean, that's kind of who we are, and we don't think about it anymore, right? And that is why this deposits and withdrawals thing is so important for you, right? Because here's what happens. Remember what it says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, because whatever you say will produce something. It will either produce a deposit, or it will produce a withdrawal. And again, I ask you, what are you producing? Withdrawals or deposits? A lot of times in our life, here's what we think about words. They're just words. I was frustrated. I didn't really mean it. Let's just move past it. It's not such a big deal, right? Go to this verse in Song of Solomon with me real quick. Song of Solomon 2.8, I believe is what it was. Song of Solomon 2.15. I'm sorry, I should have looked. Yep, that's the one I want. Look what it says. It says, catch the foxes. This is Solomon and his bride talking. It says, catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil the, the vineyards, for our vineyards are in blossom. Okay, if you've ever read Song of Solomon, weird book, right? It's got some strange writing in it. He writes in a way that's just kind of like a love letter. But here's what he's trying to say this. Catch the foxes for us, the little foxes that spoil our vineyards. Foxes, a little bit of, you know, you ever seen a fox, they don't look harmful at all. They would sneak into the vineyards and they would eat the blossoms, right, before the grapes could produce. And if they got in and they destroyed the entire um, vineyard, then you were left destitute, okay? And what Solomon is trying to say about love in the Song of Solomon, he's going, hey, I know some things seem like small things, like a fox, but you need to go in and destroy the small things before you worry about the big things. Let me ask you a question. In your marriage, in your relationships, do you usually focus on the big things at hand or do you focus on the small things at hand? Man, I, I know we fight a lot. I know we say a lot, but, but we're not cheating on one another. We're not doing this. We're not doing that. We're not, you know, we're not, we're not checking off the big boxes. We just argue a little. Solomon, the wisest guy in the world, said, don't be afraid of the shark. Be afraid of the fox. Why? Because if the fox comes in and eats everything that is there to be eaten, he leaves destitution and destruction 
and a lack of future growth. You see, here's what we got to understand. What are we producing? Are we producing words inside of our marriage that is creating a lack of future growth in our lives? We don't think words are that big a deal. But whatever we say produces a deposit or a withdrawal. Somebody asked me earlier this week, they go, how do you not use notes? And I go, sometimes I have to use notes. And today is one of those, right? Uh, here's the next one. Ephesians 4.29. I want you to go there real quick. Angry words produce a lack of grace, okay? I want to read that, that verse in James, and then I want to bring you to this one real quick. Remember what I said in the book of James. He said, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, for anger only produces what you do not want in your life. Look at Ephesians 4.29. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth, but only such that is good for building up as befits the occasion that it may give grace, grace to those who hear, right? I was at a baseball game yesterday with my boys, uh, with my older son, and uh, actually your son was pitching. And we were, uh, we were playing this team, and we were tons better than them. We were so much better than them, and they beat us. And the reason they beat us was very simple. You ready? Because the things that were coming out of their mouth was not graceful. They were on one side of the field yelling everything they could possibly yell to screw up our kids. They were yelling, you guys are going to choke. You guys are horrible. Look, they're all rattled now. Look, they're scared to be here. I mean, they're yelling everything they can possibly yell. And you're watching our kids get angrier. And you're watching them get madder. And you're watching them throw the ball harder. And you're watching them swing it as hard as they can. You're, you're watching them like, you know... <laughs> For lack of a better word, cussing at the other team. I mean, they are frustrated, right? Because it rattled them. It got them out of their game. Angst, through words, creates us to get out of our emotional game. Whereas grace given through words causes us to relax, right? It causes us to be okay with who we are. Imagine if I took a, a, a Jenga or I took a game that took a lot of concentration and it took a lot of, it required a lot of you being all in on that game. And I stood here the entire time and I went, you're horrible. You're never going to get this. You're never going to figure it out. I don't know why you're playing this game. You would start to get this angst feeling in your heart, right? In our marriages sometimes, what do we do? We get hypercritical of one another. We say things that we shouldn't. We say things that we don't even mean because we're emotional. And all of a sudden it puts our spouse kind of on alert and they kind of get that <gasps> feeling in their life. Especially those of us that are very type A and maybe hypercritical. You find yourself like that? Because if there's no grace in your marriage, then I can guarantee you there's no trust in your marriage. If you're afraid to screw up, then you're afraid of your spouse. What if? Just a thought. What if just the simple words that were coming out of your mouth... We're creating a lack of trust, a lack of hope, a lack of future in your home. How would you feel? What would it cause you to think? Got one, two more things that I want you to think about real quickly, and then we're going to be done. Proverbs 18.21. Proverbs 18.21 says this, Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat of its fruits. Here's what it says. The power of the tongue either creates death or it creates life, right? I was working in Augusta, Georgia, one of my favorite stories that I get to tell. I was working in Augusta, Georgia, and I, I had this thing that I did called student leadership where I would take students, I'd raise them up, I'd give them leadership, and I'd let them lead the student ministry, right? And I had this girl who this mom comes in, she goes, you got to get this girl to be a student leader, you have got to get her. I said, why? She goes, man, she's talking to people about Jesus. She's such an example of who Christ is in her school. Every time I talk to somebody, they think that she's awesome. And you've got to get her to be a student leader. And I went, okay, yeah, man, I'd love to have a kid like that. So Wednesday night rolled around, and we always had this big Wednesday night family meal at our church because we had this big cafeteria. And I walk in, and I see her. So I walk up to this little girl, and I go, man, I have been hearing amazing things about you. And she goes, Me? And I go, yeah. 
I've been hearing that you're like a phenomenal leader and that you've been talking to your friends about Jesus and that, that man, you need to be a student leader. She goes, me. And I go, yeah, you. I'm, I'm telling you, I am hearing person after person after person tell me how great you are. Would you be a student leader? And she goes, well, yeah, I'd love to. Turned out to be one of the best student leaders we ever had, ever had. Want to hear the funny part of the story? I was talking to the wrong girl. <laughs> I thought I was talking to the right girl. They had the same first name. And I was talking to the wrong one because I'd never seen their face before. We had like 500 kids in that youth group. And I had never seen this girl. She was kind of new, right? And this girl was out drinking on the weekends, getting drunk. She was sleeping around. She was doing all the things that, you know, you, you're afraid your teenager's going to do. And all of a sudden, she went from that to being the greatest student leader in our ministry that we had next to one other boy. Why? Because of that verse right there. Death and life are in the power of your tongue. You want a great wife? Then tell her she's a great wife. You want a great husband? Then encourage him to be a great husband. You want a great marriage? Then talk about how awesome your marriage is. Why is it we always talk about the negative side? Because negativity produces negativity. Positivity produces positive behaviors. Let me ask you this. Just make it just dumb simple, okay? In your marriage, when you have conversations about your marriage, are they positive conversations or are they negative? Is it always about what needs to be fixed or is it about what is so right about it? I think the human nature tells us, point out the negative things and just be okay with the positives. It's incredibly dangerous because death and life it right there can I encourage you in something you want your husband to look a certain way then tell him you see him that way tell him that's how you envision him you want your wife to, to, to love you in a certain way then tell her that you that you love that about her believe it for her when she doesn't even believe it herself positive words are huge Anybody a words of affirmation person in here? You love to hear people say nice things. You can raise a high. They're like, come on, raise them high. Words of affirmation people, get your hand up. Here we go. What do you like? Are words of affirmation people shy? How about positive touch people? People like to be touched. You'd rather have a hug than be told I love you. Who's that person? Right? Okay, James is that person. We have some, we have some, uh, some other people I saw. Uh, I think I saw you were like the words of affirmation person, weren't you? Didn't you raise it? Yeah, there you go. Right? So, you know, words are so easy. They're so easy to say something negative to somebody. But, but let me ask you a question there, Mrs. Bachhorst. What if every time you were frustrated at him, you just pinched him as hard as you could? Would you appreciate that? No. <laughs> but you're a touch person, right? Why do we think, well, we can say whatever we want to somebody, but I would never pinch them. That would hurt them, right? Because words don't mean that much to us. But the Bible tells us death and life are steered with them. Let me finish you with this verse, okay? This is the one that I think is going to probably hit us all between the eyes. So just kind of prepare. Here we go. Proverbs 22, 6. Proverbs 22, 6. Here's what it says. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. When I think about this verse, I don't know about you, but I think... I want my son to be godly, so I'm going to train him up to be godly. I want my son to, you know, be honest, so I'm going to train him up to be honest. I'm going to, I'm going to train him up to do this, 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 and this. How are you training him to be a husband? How are you training him to be a wife? You know what this verse says? Model for your child the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. Model it for them. Because whatever you produce in front of them is what by legacy they will produce of you. And if they see you shouting at your wife all the time, if they see you saying cheap words, if they don't see you valuing her or him, right, then what are they going to do? They're going to go find a spouse and they're going to act exactly like you. <laughs> my son, my oldest son, you may know him or you may not know him. Everybody laughs because we are the spitting image of one another. He talks like me. He acts like me. We're just the same person, right? And my faults come out in him, and I'm like, oh, gosh, I taught him that, right? 
What will your kids get from you? If Parenting 101 in your home, in your life, were to stop today, would you be happy with what you passed along to them on how to be a spouse, a lover, a helpmate? How would, you, how would you feel your training went? James writes this, man, under duress, be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to become angry, because anger does not produce the righteousness of life. I'm going to give you the most simple ending that I can possibly give you. If you don't say it, it can't hurt them. If you don't say it, it can't hurt them. I got, I got a question for you. I don't know about you, but this is me. When I get frustrated, I write text messages that never get sent. Anybody else? I will write the most scathing text message you can ever see in your life, right? And then I'll push delete. Because I don't want that to get to that other person because I realize my words can act in such destruction. Uh, let me ask you this question. Do you ever think in your mind things that you're going to say to somebody and then feel guilty for thinking that? Anybody? Am I the only person? Okay, and you feel like immense guilt, like, oh, I shouldn't have said that. And then you go, oh, thank God I didn't say that, right? Why? Because our silence can't hurt people. Our silence can't destroy our marriage. Our silence can't take a legacy of our children and put it out there and say, hey, here's how it goes. If I stay silent, my kid can learn nothing negative from me when I'm emotional and angry. But if I just let this lip start flying, what does James say in chapter 3? He says, your tongue is like a fire that will set the whole forest ablaze. So as I give you any instruction on, hey, how do I make my marriage strong and not talk about the things that I want to say all the time? Here's it, here it is, you ready? There is freedom in shutting your mouth. There is no imprisonment in opening your mouth. There's only imprisonment when you when, or in shutting your mouth. There's only imprisonment when you let your lips run, right? How many of you have gone, man, I really paid the price for not saying that? Very rarely. But when I let my lips run, whoo, I paid the price for that a lot. How about you? And according to James, what I'm doing is I am producing destruction in my marriage a lack of grace a lack of trust a lack of legacy I'm not killing the small things that could destroy me I'm letting the small things destroy everything that I'm about I want to end this way you ready if your spouse is next to you I want you to do me a favor I want you to close your eyes for a second if, even if your spouse is not because you're gonna go home and do this to them ready just close your eyes for a second and the reason I got your eyes closed is I want you to focus on this. You ready? What is the most positive thing right now that you could say to your spouse? Not you're awesome. I like your hair. Sweater's cool because I know how guys are. What is the most positive thing you could say to your spouse right now? Even if you're mad at them, what is the thing that you love about them? Daniel, come on up. Everybody's head's still bowed and eyes still closed. Daniel's going to come up and he's going to play with the band. You got those words? Just keep your head bowed. Keep thinking about it. And as Daniel comes up to play, here's what I want to do. As the music begins... I simply want you to lean over into your spouse's ear or your significant other's ear or the person in your life that maybe they hear all the words that you say. And I want you to tell them what is so great about them. Your tongue is death or your tongue is life. Let's practice life. As Daniel said. Almost 
face to face I see my beautiful wife Always smiling But on the inside I can hear her saying Leave me with strong hands Stand up when I can Don't leave me Hungry for love Chasing dreams But what about us? Show me You're willing to fight That I'm still The love of your life I know we Call this a home But I Faces look in their innocent lies, they're just children from the outside. I'm working hard, I tell myself that we're fine, they're independent, but on the inside, I can hear them saying, Leave me with strong hands. Stay I want to read you the rest of James chapter 2, he's talk, or 1. He's talking about this, this destruction that's going on in their lives and how do we handle this. Here's what he said. Therefore, put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness, wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word of God. You know what meekness is? It's when I'm humble. It's when I'm quiet. It's when I'm still. And what am I receiving? The implanted word of God. In other words, shut up and listen to what God has to say. It's basically what James is saying. Hey, if you'll stop talking and listen to God more than you instruct, Man, God can do amazing things through you. But our emotions go, man, just say it because it'll feel better. It doesn't feel better. It has incredible consequences, right? This week as you go, remember, if you don't say it, you're not responsible for it. If you don't say it, you can't destroy with it. So if you got something to say and it's just harsh, just step back and just tell God you're sorry. Get in his word. In the book of James, read it and talk about it and think about it and avoid destroying your marriage further.